So, so the two lines of discussions, I'm going to uh, uh, paraphrase some of the topics that you guys sent me. Um, the first one uh, uh, has to do with visualization. And uh, the questions are all related to each other, but um, um, I, I'm going to summarize them here. Um, what are the community needs for a virtual reality or augmented reality techniques for neuroscience research? Uh, what is the potential for virtual reality as scientific visualization to enhance neuroscience research, knowledge, and education or training? And uh, what brain network visualization limitations need to be improved upon or what problems need to be solved with respect to visualization? And uh, um, what kind of risks should we be aware of when simplifying network visualization? So um, these are mostly topics for the speakers from earlier this morning, but I believe that um, others of you have uh, dealt with visualization uh, through modeling as well. Uh, so I'll uh, um, open the floor. Um, feel free to comment on these uh, as a start. Hi. Um, so basically, uh, virtual reality, <coughs> sorry, and augmented reality is quite early days in terms of technology. I know it's been around since 70s, but uh, it didn't have time to grow into a into a mature uh, technology. Uh, there, there's, uh, I think, there's huge potentials. Uh, we still need uh, some more hardware to come along. You know, the haptic devices. As I was talking earlier, I think there will be an important uh, element in there. And um, I think in terms of uh, simplifying uh, the, the models, basically, that we visualize, I think that there's the other side where as, as the hardware is going to improve and uh, we can develop new techniques of visualizing where we improve the rendering times by optimizing the way we render rather than uh, tweaking the model itself. I know we're talking about a lot of data here that needs to be visualized, but uh, I, I think with a lot of work on that side, we can we can preserve that uh, data integrity and just work on on the back end where we're optimizing it in that way. Um, I think. Um, uh, this topic is relatively big, okay, it probably can hardly be discussed uh, um, within a few minutes, okay, but I would like to actually kind of like use a uh, uh, recent um, example, this uh, popular Pokemon Go probably as an uh, example to um, highlight the importance to use uh, uh, augmented reality and uh, maybe also virtual reality for our research. So um, I have a seven-year-old. Okay, so and this little boy actually kind of like simply get addicted to Pokemon Go and um, he probably can play it all day long and uh, until kind of like uh, eventually I force him to sleep. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, what's actually really interesting out there is that okay about the game itself okay, from a, a developer perspective because I I did write some of the you know as sh I show actually in my talk okay I, I developed some of the um, uh, large-scale visualization stuff okay myself right F so from a developer kind of like um, perspective I kind of like feel the um, the novel part is really about the game is that it's uh, let you be able to kind of like overlay the any of this kind of like uh, gaming components including all the reward okay on top of the uh, um, uh, geographical kind of kind of like uh, information so that's you know and then you can actually form some sort of like community I think that actually this you know in, um, uh, instead of kind of like use this just for the gaming purpose I think this could actually also become a very useful learning tools okay for example in this kind of like a conference environment, okay, y if we actually kind of everybody actually kind of start to play that, okay, and we could actually use the same mechanism, okay, to have a much better way to illustrate the ideas, okay, and if we overlay some of the presentation, you know, the, the brain network we care about, right, so, and, and then we could actually, you know, you know, have formed some sort of very, you know, more vivid communication with the colleague, okay, and then to share idea, and, you know, while one guy actually doing the, um, um, 
plantation and the other guys actually could actually um really get a much better idea what exactly what this you know presenter you know means and maybe you know receive some feedback or this kind of thing i think this is another form of the arg augmented reality i think it could actually bring um onto the table okay so um and along this line and i think you know that's why actually the big um, a company like Facebook, like Google, they actually want to put a lot of kind of like investments, you know, and I think this probably will also be the next kind of generation of the social platform. I think we, uh, from the neuroscience um, perspective, certainly one thing we, we could think about is that to understand the neuron basis so about this thing, right? So that's, you know, obvious. But on the other hand, I feel that it's probably more important to, you know, let the community start to develop some of the useful tool for ourselves, okay? So that, you know, try to, you know, uh, make it much easier to communicate, especially scientific ideas, okay, to exchange the data, to share our, you know, resource, to make everybody more productive. I certainly like the idea of walking around the brain and say, you know, I found an axaxonic cell. Those are really <laughs> rare, you know, 10,000 points. Uh, <laughs> more, more comments on uh, uh, anything from Pokemon Go to... Uh, Not quite Pokemon Go, but just to probably add to what Esther said. So I just spoke about this tool, BluePyOpt, that we've released to, it's basically like a Python environment to model uh, single neuron physiology. And, and one, one thing about BluePyOpt is that it's cloud-based, so you can, you can run it on a cloud. So, for example, I mean, you raised the point of uh, hardware and visualization. So one way to go is probably to, to run all this on a cloud, you know, so to, to really le leverage the, the advantage of cloud computing, perhaps. I don't know if this looked into, so, because I'm, I'm, I'm by no means a visualization expert, so. Uh, just to add to that, um, basically, I think Microsoft did a test. Uh, they've done a test with Xbox One, where actually they run a very high, um, uh, very intense uh, rendering over uh, physics simulation uh, from a local machine. And basically, I, I think it was tenfold when they run it from the cloud. So slowly, the infrastructure is coming into place, where we will be able to run these kind of uh, elements from a cloud. So like like a point of of, of all uh, all the data sitting there and collaborating and, and being able to be verified at the same time uh, and just um, j we, we're just gonna have a, a set of devices that's gonna filter through uh, all that data so maybe if I can ask just one question to the fellow people in the panel I, I definitely uh, see the, the, the aspect that you were talking about, that just by enhancing collaboration, making it more fun, basically, and more exciting, uh, you uh, create creativity uh, and you uh, motivate people. But I was wondering, uh, the, the, there's quite a drive to virtualization now, uh, and in, in some of those cases I can see the point, especially by you know, bringing people closer together. In other cases, I'm, I'm not so sure, so I wanted to ask you, uh, if there was, I mean, I can understand that VR uh, is making it um, more fun or, or easier, more efficient uh, to interact with the model. But would you say there are actually some aspects where some discoveries were made by having a VR version uh, of, of, of the brain rather than just accessing it the normal way or, or trying to analyze it the normal way? So that's a great point. Okay, let me um, summarize a little bit once he um was asking exactly he was asking okay in addition to kind of like you know some sort of like um, um uh, data sharing purpose or so maybe even um entertaining kind of like you know aspect f for the technology okay that would bring into the uh, field okay once this could actually really become an enabler of the, some sort of like game changer let us be able to kind of like generate better discovery maybe at a lower cost or maybe you know something like that right so um I actually definitely kind of like uh, vote for it. Okay, so um, um, so this become this comment become a little bit more technical, right? So uh, normally the the reason why actually is, um, uh, just like uh, you know I, I forgot you probably just you know show in your 
um, um, uh, uh, we are saying is that okay. Normally, when people actually generate the three D visualization and then actually put it into the real environment, so that's pretty much based on that you know the generation of certain model. Okay, the ge uh, 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 geometric model. Okay, consists of the, like a surface object, all this kind of thing, right? So, um, so one of the limitation. Okay, for that actually pretty big limitation is that. In the process, when people generate the model, okay, normally there will be information loss, and also because we only visualize the model that already been generated, so that basically anything that's related to discovery probably already been discovered, you know, already in the process of the model generation, but not through the further interaction with the model, you know, in the visualization process. So, but on the other hand, okay. So the, the the one thing I didn't highlight in my talk is about the virtual finger is that we could actually visualize okay a lot more information without pre-generating such a model okay so actually that's a very important thing actually um um, um uh, in this kind of like virtual finger enabled you know uh, scenario is that we could actually start with the multi-dimensional density data, which is the image data in this particular case is that once you actually let the, you know, use certain kind of like, uh, you know, camera taking the picture in multi-dimensions, okay, and even uh, such, such multi-dimensional data could also kind of like from other domain, for example, like brain network or something like that, okay, and this new technology let you be able to navigate, you know, at the unprecedented, you know, speed, okay, and the accuracy let you be able to do a lot of kind of exploration and for the knowledge discovery and detecting the pattern which had not been kind of like you know uh, 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 modeled use a surface object or something like that so i think if in the next generation of the, this augment reality engine sooner or later it will come out of something like this particular type is that for the real real world kind of like a picture which has not been segmented and modeled using a surface object how you would be able to really directly manipulate the objects the semantic objects there directly in addition to watch your finger i recently i read another kind of like article about some lab actually at mit actually try to also do the similar things okay um probably in the last year also okay they for example they just take a arbitrary picture and there is a, for example a car in the picture, they try to actually kind of like, you know, let people be able to directly move that car around without pre-segmenting it, okay? So that idea intrinsically kind of like similar to what I talk about, you know, in the virtual finger case, okay? But we actually, you know, deal with the multi-dimensional, they only deal with the two-dimensional. But basically that's the idea, okay? Certainly that can enable a lot of new discovery because you kind of like directly do many other things. But on top of that, a, 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 a application that could be kind of like you know, generated is about this uh, kind of three-dimensional free-form surgery. Okay, I want to I, I do want to like mention a little bit that potentially also have some relationship to some of the researcher here is that for example for the brain surgery, right? So right now, uh, if someone have the brain tumor, okay, they use this, this kind of like a gamma life or something like that during this the brain surgery, right? So basically, that let's this focus the gamma, you know, uh, ray, you know, beam, okay, somewhere and then knockouts, you know, basically a blade you know, such an um, uh, 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 area, okay? But normally during such a surgery process, okay, you can only kind of like burn particular location, but you cannot like, you know, kind of like create arbitrary shape like a, like a surgery, okay? So we actually use this virtual finger technology actually to create something called the free f three dimensional free form surgery. We already implement such a system actually for the laser ablation experiment actually reported in our paper, so that you can actually kind of like use the focus the laser beam to cut through anywhere in the neural circuits. And then after this such kind of like surgery, you can actually do the simultaneous kind of like, you know, custom imaging. And then you can actually use this as a way to do a systematic kind of like, you know, perturbation of the, of the brain's kind of like structure and then observe what happened in the, in the function, you know, domain. And I kind of like personally believe this could become a very, very powerful thing, okay, in the future to understand the brain function and lead to a lot of discovery. Uh, yeah. I, I see Jeff has been holding on the uh, <laughs> for a long time now. <laughs> I, I just wanted to answer Klaus's question in a different way. Uh, was, that was a really interesting answer. But uh, thinking of it from you know my robotic standpoint and, and how to discover. Uh, 
So, you know, we, we did robotics for a number of years because the virtual reality tools and augmented reality tools weren't, weren't good enough. We wanted the complexity of the environment. But when you, I mean, the brain is all about behavior, right? Tying brain activity to drive action so you can survive in the world. So, so we were doing this to close the loop. Now, looking at some of Marius's work and some of the others, I think now you can do that discovery. You can put good models on there, but then you can put them in different environments that it wasn't exposed to and then get discovery that way. So I think it's important that we're getting to the stage where we can close the loop between the brain, the body, and the environment. Mm -hmm. Any, uh, Sorry, uh, can I add yeah, just one on. more element to that? Sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. no. uh, one of the big differences uh, between rendering in 3D on a flat screen and stereoscopic rendering, basically, is, is actually the way we see things in 3D on a flat screen is how the light bounces off those objects. So how, that's how the rendering, that's how we know an object is in front of another object. With stereoscopic vision, we don't have that kind of issue. We will see the objects in front of others. So we will be able to select accurately, not based on a, on a shading uh, 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 algorithm that we write. It's basically we're going to see actually on position on the world on, the, on the, that particular axis. So that then becomes even more crucial in something like uh, surgery or identifying different parts of a, of a compl complicated network. And that's why I think uh, both uh, augmented reality and virtual reality it, it will have a big impact once the technology matures enough. Can you uh, expand the topic here with the second set of questions? And it, we, we veer close to uh, philosophy, but I think we're still grounded in science. So it's the second set of questions, from the more general to the more specific. Uh, what could be considered an appropriate level of biological detail in large, in large scale brain model? How could large-scale detail and simplified models inform us about brain function? What are the most relevant data for understanding brain structure and function that should be systematically collected? The challenge is weeding out spurious correlations in big data analysis. And lastly, how can we make large-scale complex models stable? The brain operates over a wide range of scales, but our models take forever to tune and are often brittle. This is kind of a complementary aspect of the conversation uh, for large scale as well. well uh, yeah, I would like to say something. So, um, a couple of years ago, um, Chris Elias Smith brought out this um, paper. I think it was in the uh, Trends in Neurosciences. He called it the use and abuse of large scale brain models. So, there, uh, Chris posed a question what's the appropriate level of detail to, uh, I mean, what's the appropriate level of detail a model should capture? So, I mean, of course, this depends on the kind of questions you want to answer. But on the other hand, if you had a framework to really try and, and like a scaffold framework that captures much of the, the structural complexity, uh, then it would be possible to, to then use this scaffold, this complex um, framework to simplify as you please, because then it gives you a reference. Otherwise, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, in, a, in a simplified model, like, how could you say, if you already start off by building something that's very simple, then how do you be able to say that, oh, it's this neuron type that supports gamma oscillations, it's this neuron type that supports beta oscillations or something like that. So, so you know, uh, so I, I, I guess, you know, there has to be some kind of a convergence between these bottom-up detailed models and, and, and these top-down models in, 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 in more of a, like a, a systematic fashion is, is, is what I believe. I don't know if you have to say something about this, Jeff. Yeah, uh, the question always comes up at these roundtables, what's the proper level? And I guess the, uh, the answer is always, uh, it depends on the question you're asking. But I, I think we're at a stage, and actually getting, I've been around for a while now, and it used to be everyone said, why are you making this model with so many neurons? I can do this in 10. You know? And now it's gone the other way around. Like, why can't you make a larger model? Uh, so it's interesting how the, sort of the feeling has changed. But I think now we're at the stage where we have both of those. So I think uh, you can take large scale models, hopefully, and extract some principles to get uh, some sort of more top down models and, and vice versa. The top down models can inform the, the bottom. And, and, and you know, it depends, as, as I said, on what you're trying to answer. If it's the detailed connectivity like Klaus is doing, or if it's something that's tied to behavior in real time, like, like we would be doing. Uh, we, we have real time constraints, so it's, that limits. And uh, I guess while I have the mic, I was the one that brought up the tuning. Uh, 
And at all these stages, I don't care if it's top down, simple, or, or very detailed models, but the problems get worse, detailed models. Once you have something that's brain-like with recurrent structure, you have incredible instability. And, and just, it boggles my mind how the brain stays stable over a wide range of uh, environmental constraints, both internal and external. And I don't think we have an answer for that. And I think uh, I'm starting to get a hint from some people that do, like uh, Carl Friston and others that are doing more theoretical ideas, but it's still a very open issue that, that we have to deal with if we're going to go forward, because we're trying to make more and more complex things, and, uh, and the brain is able to somehow have this complexity and still operate. Um, so it's something to think about. that strikes me in thinking about these two topics is that I would expect perhaps the computational modeling and the simulations and the visualization to uh, be more integrated with each other, with much more in common. And, uh, and things such as uh, measures of complexity, graph theoretic analysis, and uh, uh, both top-down and bottom-up approaches to the relationship between structure and function uh, will be natural uh, 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 points of uh, interface between visualization and models. And the fact that we are now running models on GPUs, and, uh, uh, and, and those are really driven by visualization from the game industry, et cetera. Are we uh, going to get to a point where we can, in, in real time, create models and visualize, and vice versa, uh, uh, affect the models from the visualization in an interactive way? And maybe that's too, too forward thinking, but. Uh, right. Um. <coughs> Just want to add some um, uh, uh, short comments on that. Um, we have been kind of like uh, thinking about um, have this end-to-end -end, um, um, onboard um, uh, experiment. You know, basically start with the uh, imaging of third in in the functional screening experiment, right? So basically, image some um, area of the of the brain. Okay, and then, you know, in the same system, okay, we want to run some sort of like real-time analysis and identify um, the um, regional interest for certain neurons, or okay, maybe compa at the compartment level, something like that, okay? And then run the simulation and modeling and simulation there, okay? And then predict what would actually happen. And then, you know, go back to the experiment, okay? In the same experiment, and then, you know, change the type of stimuli, and then do some sort of like, you know, iterative kind of like hypothesis generation and then you know verification type of things okay so and certainly this will need to use the entire process of the data collection uh, acquisition collection you know management visualization and uh, and the uh, simulation modeling you know um, neural reconstruction and so on and so forth and uh, also quite a bit of the data analysis out there okay but such a system as far as i know okay have not been successfully implemented yet okay we got this kind of like you know conceptual kind of like you know idea okay for a while but we even for ourselves i still feel um we haven't been able to really kind of like put the modeling and the simulation that's a critical step actually into the entire loop yet okay why because you know when when you actually really kind of like dig into the problem you actually find you know many of the moderner okay they actually the, the actual model they work on actually is very very different from the data you know uh, it directly come out of the experiment okay so there are a lot of assumptions about many parameter adjusting that actually prevent us from directly kind of like you know include such model okay in the experiment so that's what probably the major reason why this haven't been done yet okay um as far as i know yeah so the, i guess the question was that can we put all these things together in the tools and and i think well this is a big this society has been very good about sharing right so and there's huge open source communities outside of us, and I think that's what's driving a lot of these things. So a lot of us are talking about GPUs. That's because it was driven by the video game industry. And then you were talking about Pokemon Go and augmented reality and, and, uh, and smartphone technology and cloud computing. So I, my advice is just keep watching what the trends are and, and leveraging what the community is doing, keep sharing. I, I, I think that we're going to get there very soon. I mean, because the tools are in place, we're developing some, but there are a lot of people developing them for a lot of other reasons. So, so uh, that's what we've been trying to do is keep our eye on the pulse and not try and uh, develop things in house, but use as much shared stuff as, as possible. And then I think all of us have been very good about sharing our data and sharing our models. And I think that's, that's key to getting there too.
making sure everyone mm -hmm. have their say. Esther, do you want to have any closing thoughts since uh, you've been quiet? Um, I don't, I'm not that much into visualization, but as, a, as I'm doing analysis of brain networks, I do face problems with visualization. My, my networks are quite big, and when I visualize into the what we all tend to do is just apply a threshold and forget about those connections and just try to figure out uh, what we can see with just two D images. So I think the virtual reality will, will make a big difference in perhaps doing this, this sort of analysis. I always think that an ideal world would be to, to have like the network visualization, like the idea of Google Maps, where you can see everything from a very far point where you only see the most relevant thing that or the more relevant stuff for you. And then as soon as you get closer, uh, you see these little, little, little connections that sometimes with just applying threshold, there is a risk that we will lose this, this information. So I think virtual re reality will, will make a, a big uh, improvement in, in this sort of visualization. So probably multi-scale is, is a good term for both visualization and modeling. You know, Klaus has been on this for many years. So. Yeah. Um, I think we, uh, we're, we're closing almost in time, and I know uh, Matthew has uh, announcements for a slight change in uh, uh, schedule and uh, um, uh, two more sessions. I would like to thank uh, all the participants of this panel and speakers for this morning. It was